Let's get started. Again, good afternoon and welcome to Business Behind the Scenes. I am Brenda Lewis, Senior Member Relations Manager at the Tulsa Regional Chamber, and I'm pleased to welcome you all today. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize our generous sponsors who make events like this possible. Our Business Behind the Scenes sponsors are Exceptional Leaders Lab and m, &M Lumber. Our small business benefactors are Exceptional Leaders Lab, Security Bank, Southwestern Payroll, and Web Branding. And our small business supporting sponsors are Integrated Business Technologies and TEDC Creative Capital. Again, I'd like to thank these sponsors for their generous support. We're thrilled to have Lisa Riley, owner of three Pinos Palette locations in the Tulsa region with us today. We'll have a Q&A session at the end, so be sure to write your questions down during her presentation. Lisa, pardon me, Lisa first purchased her first Pinos Palette location in 2011 and now owns and operates four Pinos Palette franchises in the Tulsa area. She has locations on Cherry Street, Broken Arrow and Jinx, and a mobile unit. Since opening in 2012, Lisa Studios have hosted more than 187,000 painters. It's a big number, Lisa. She's received numerous accolades, including the University of Tulsa's Golden Heart Award, Oklahoma Woman of the Year nominee, the Small Business Administration's Women in Business Small Business Champion, the International Franchisee of the Year, and most recently, the Oklahoma Small Business of the Year. Lisa, I'll now pass it over to you. Okay, well, that made me feel or sound really important when I'm not. So, um, like, listening to that, I'm like, is that really me? I don't know. I feel like I'm that goofy girl from Bixby. So, you know, whatever. I'll take it, though. If it makes me sound cooler than I am, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so, my name is Lisa Riley. Um, so, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit of real background about myself and about Pinos. And so, I love to keep things very real and uh, tell you, like, just some of my luck and some of, um, you know, the good and the bad and the ugly. So I, I'm from Bixby and um, I went to Oklahoma State, go Pokes. And um, anyways, long story short, I was living in Houston and uh, working for ConocoPhillips. So my background is actually big corporate America in um, oil and gas. So my career started out in Tulsa at Quick Trip and then I met my husband on a business trip and he took me to Houston. So I worked for ConocoPhillips for several years, and this is where Pinos comes in. And so um, while I was down there, uh, one of my companies that I used contracting um, my inspection companies for my overseas cargo ships, wanted to take a bunch of us from ConocoPhillips to a um, paint and sip studio. And I was like, I don't paint. I can drink wine with the best of them, but I don't, but I don't paint. And um, so I said, you know, thank you. I'll just let you take everyone else. I'm not going to go. And they talked me into going. Um, and so I went and I loved it. And um, funny enough, if I wouldn't have went there, I probably would have never owned a franchise. I'd probably still be managing refinery inventories and overseas cargo ships. So um, funny story. So when we we're at the studio that night. I was like, God bless, this is a lot of fun. You know, I, this is a great time. And the guys liked it, the girls liked it. We drank a lot and um, we had a really good time. And we went back every six months for, I don't know, several years having a, a great time. And so this is a true story and I don't tell the story very often, but um, one afternoon, one of my neighbors and I, we both had just had our first children and so we were new moms and we both needed an afternoon out. So our husbands were like, why don't you go to that paint place that you like um, down in the cool district and we'll watch the kiddos. So we went down there and um, drank some wine and we're painting. And while we were painting, I was like, you know, I wonder if they franchise this. And so my girlfriend was like, they probably do. You should just like look at doing it. And so long story short, I wrote the company while we were sitting there painting and I forgot all about it. And um, several weeks later, I'm down in a board meeting uh, with a bunch of executives from ConocoPhillips around a table and my phone rang and it was a Houston number. And I thought it was one of my um, VPs that was down the hall in a different meeting. So I answered it and this guy was like, hey, this is the president of Pino's Palette. You, in, you were inquiring about franchising. And I was like, um, I'm gonna step out of the meeting real quick. And I stepped out in the hallway and I'm like, I'm gonna have to call you back. And I thought, oh my God, I totally forgot that I did that. So mom brain is real um, anyways. And so 
um, I called him back, you know, maybe a week later and kind of just talked with him and said, you know, I just inquired, but um, I, you know, I love the concept. I think it's great. I don't know anything about art, but um, I think it'd be awesome where I'm from. I want to move back home. We're looking at, you know, doing things like that. And um, I, we don't have anything like that in Tulsa. I'd love to bring a different kind of, I call it intelligent fun, just kind of something to do that's entertainment besides just go out and eat or go to the movies or go on dates or kids or things like that. And so anyways, long story short, I researched it for seven months because if I take a risk, it's always a calculated risk. And so I researched it for seven months and um, convinced my husband to quit his job and move to Tulsa, Oklahoma. My husband is not from here. He's from Iowa and he plays ba played baseball at Tennessee. So we both have orange in the house, which is such a great thing that we don't have to argue over orange is okay in the house. So um, I convinced him to move to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, he still works in oil and gas. He works for One Oak currently. And um, he's been there since we moved and he loves it, loves his job, runs pipeline. And so anyways, I own Pinos. And so it's crazy. We opened our first location on Cherry Street. I didn't know what I was doing. Funny story, um, no one would give me money to open the stores. So when I bought Pinos, I bought the, the franchise with savings and then I moved home and I was like, I can't wait to get open. And I called nine banks, all the banks everyone uses here in town and no one would loan me the money. So that's, that's a truth bomb right there that most people don't know. So um, I remember my dad called me one day and I was having an emotional breakdown because I'm like, I bought this franchise. I don't have the money to build it out. No one will give me the money. I just assumed that if I had really good credit, which I did, still do, if I had really good credit, a bank would just be like, okay, here's a couple hundred grand, go build out a store, whatever. And it turns out you gotta have a track record in business before they'll give you a business loan. So um, I, my dad called me and, um, and I was having kind of a breakdown that day. And long story short, he goes, you know what? I, I trust you, I'll, I'll loan you the money. And so I said, well, dad, I want this to be um, very business. You know, I'm, I'm prideful, not owing anybody any money. And so I got an attorney involved and we drew up loan paperwork and my dad loaned me the money. I opened Cherry Street. I bought the franchise in July of 2011, but we didn't open until March of 2012. Here is another business hurdle, and I don't even know if my manager who's sitting here managing the Cherry Street store, if she knows this story. So we spent our entire budget that I had borrowed from my father to build out the Cherry Street store. And it turns out that, and this is crazy, on Cherry Street, there are bars and restaurants everywhere. Well, our concept was so new, we don't serve food, and we don't have a hotel. So you have to have food or somewhere for people to sleep for you to have really just a bar. So we are not considered a bar. So they didn't know what category to put us in. So they put Pinos in the adult entertainment category. So I had to go, after we spent all of our budget to build out and to get open, we couldn't open because the city block that we are on, on Cherry Street, is not zoned for adult, adult entertainment nor for alcohol for a bar. Also for Tulsa, you can't have two bars within 300 feet of each other. Now, if you serve food at the bar, that's considered a restaurant, but you can't have two bars. So there's a little tavern across the street called Drake's Tavern that seats about 10 people. They are 303 feet away. So we had to pay all this money to have a surveyor go do this. And then I was like, okay, great, we're gonna get open. Nope, not so fast. So when they put the sign out front that I had to rezone the entire city block to get open under the adult entertainment category, we had people come up and basically protest us in front of the city council at our hearing, thinking I was opening a strip club. So, which is really funny. My manager's laughing. She's never heard. Have you heard that story? No. So I have my father who doesn't drink, doesn't cuss, doesn't smoke with me in front of the city council on TV with all of these people. They're angry that I'm opening a strip club next to Chipotle. And uh, so uh, this, this is the this God honest truth. So it was really a very humbling moment to be like, I'm just trying to open and I, I'm not opening a strip club. And they thought I was doing a front to make it an art studio. So that way I could close the art studio in 30 days and really then 
since I already rezoned the block to, you know, have it as a strip club, which I was like with my father and my dad's like, what is happening? So anyways, it's a kind of a funny story. So, you know, things are never just as easy as they look on the surface. I just didn't talk about it because I didn't want anyone to know my struggles. I wanted everyone to just think I knew what I was doing when really I had no idea. I literally was flying by the seat of my pants. So we got open in March and we are so blessed. I lucked into a lot of things that I look back on now and I'm like, holy crap, I had no clue what I was doing. No clue what I was doing. And just got in with the right people, got the right influencers to come in and have them write up articles about us. So that way, when I did my big shock and awe campaign to Tulsa to be like, Pino's Palette's open on Cherry Street. Another funny hurdle is I just assumed that everyone would get the concept and no one got it. And so when we first opened, people were like, what's paint and sip? Well, everyone knows what it is now because I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last eight years to make sure that the concept was understood and that we had, you know, different avenues of, of marketing and, and things. So that way people would get it. And, um, you know, I had to do a, a lot of manipulating behind the scenes of trying to make sure that every, every post, every article had a picture of it so that maybe people would understand. Cause when people hear painting, they're like, well, I'm not an artist. Well, most of us are not artists. So, and including me, I am not an artist. I'm just a business person, but I love the concept. Um, and so anyways, we got open and it took us a while to get traction, but man, did Tulsa embrace the concept. Once we got people past the fact that it wasn't art classes, it's strictly entertainment with alcohol involved. Um, people were like, oh, well, we can give that a try. And man, we took off and it was unbelievable. So second big hurdle. So we got open and I had used all my money that I had, um, my dad had loaned me to build out Cherry Street. And of course, you know, it takes years to be able to pay back loans and, you know, get ahead. And most businesses don't even turn a profit or break even the first few years. We were fortunate that we broke even within months of opening, which was such a blessing. But let me tell you, about six months into opening, the president of Pino's or the CEO of Pino's calls me and says, where in the world is South Tulsa? Like, I, I've never been to Oklahoma. Like, wh what's going on in South Tulsa? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, you only bought the rights to Cherry Street's location. And so since we're a franchise, we can sell as many in Tulsa as we want with, if as long as our certain mile past yours. And I was like, hold on, wait, what's going on? And so within six months of us opening, they had 32 qualified candidates who had tried to apply for the franchise in South Tulsa. And um, including some of my friends, which was kind of eye-opening. And so when they didn't say anything to me about it. And so I was just like, well, hold on, you can't sell them that because what if they don't run it the same way we do it? And what if, you know, I don't know, it was one of those things where all of a sudden I felt like my destiny was in somebody else's hands. And so I'm just like, I, I don't have the money to buy a franchise. And they were like, well, we have 32 qualified candidates who have cash in hand ready to buy it. So we're going to give you a week to make a decision. And I was like, hold on. I wasn't even prepared for this. I'm thinking like down the road, we'll open another location. Maybe if this, you know, concept is proven. And um, so I went home to my husband and he was like, absolutely not. Like we just opened your, you know, when you open a business, I, I know some people, since I can't see everybody out there, but I see that there's people logged in. When you open a business, it's like having a baby. You know, the, you, you're exhausted being eight months pregnant, nine months pregnant, and you, you're, you don't, you're not sleeping. You're staying up late. Your feet hurt. You, you, you're like so stressed about for when the baby comes. And when the baby comes is when like you open your doors. So all of a sudden you've got this infant that needs like all this attention and you're up 20 hours a day. You're barely getting any sleep. And then all of a sudden the, the baby sits up and then the baby starts to crawl and then the baby starts to pull up and then the baby starts to walk. It's the same thing with business if you haven't started one from scratch. And um, I had, I mean, I had just finally was to where I was sleeping three nights a week. And my husband was like, absolutely not. Like we have, we have no time. We have a, a one-year-old baby at home and you've got a baby at Pino's and it's like it's just craziness. And so I said, but here's the problem. What if they don't run it like we do? And what if 
they have bad customer service and what if they don't their philosophy and and how to treat customers and business isn't the same way and they don't run it like we do and then they give us a bad reputation by guilty of association and i said it's not that i don't want to partner with other people but that's like putting my own savings and my own money in somebody else's hands and so my husband's like you can hustle and figure it out but i'm not helping and i'm like i got it and so i um the more i thought about it the more my gut and my intuition was like you have to do this you've got to figure it out and so um funny enough my dad, God loving, I called my dad and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. We just opened, we, I've used all the money. I'm not asking you for any, I just want some business advice. And my dad goes, well, why don't you call Red Crown Federal Credit Union? And I said, well, do they give business loans? And he goes, doesn't hurt. You might try it. So I called them and, um, you know, all these other banks had told me no before. And I called them and they were like, you got great credit. I'm hearing great things about your concept. Funny enough, the guy that I met with, he had just taken his wife the weekend before on a date and said it was the best date they'd ever been on. And it was the perfect timing. It's like God like opened all these doors. So they gave me the money to buy the franchise and also pay for the build out. And it was great. So I got Riverwalk open. And um, so we opened the Riverwalk location a year later. So I opened Cherry Street in 12, opened Riverwalk in 13. Six months after opening Riverwalk, and I had my first night of sleep. The next morning, the CEO of Pinos calls me again. And he says, where in the hell is Broken Arrow, Oklahoma? And I said, this time I have the cash. I'm paying you tomorrow. And he goes, well, we've had 27 people apply in the last few weeks, cash in hand. And I said, you don't need to do that. I'll buy it. So I had saved money to try to pay back my loans quicker. And I was like, I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and do it again. And so funny enough, when I announced we were going to open, we were opening a location in Broken Arrow, every bank that had turned me down called me and asked if we, they could fund my loan. And you know what I told every one of them? No, thank you. <laughs> so hate to say it. I mean, you know, women are like, uh, uh, don't you burn me. No. So anyways, it's just funny. Now I do banking with a lot of them. It's fine. But um, I got Broken Era open a year later. So I opened in 12, 13, and 14. I don't recommend doing that with a toddler at home. I'm not even sure I would do that if I didn't have a kid. <laughs> but I was just flying by the seat of my pants. And it was one of those things where, um, you know, you just don't know until you know. And I was naive enough to think I could do it all. And I was naive enough to just be like, we'll figure it out. We'll just make it work. I feel like I'm, I'm a hard worker and a hustler, but you know, it also matters that you have a great team. And I was extremely fortunate to have some of the best team members ever that have come to work for me. Um, Crystal, who manages my Riverwalk store, she's been with me from our one year anniversary on Cherry Street. She helped me open the Riverwalk store. And she's been with me since she is now um I, if, if you had to look at a hierarchy she's underneath me so god forbid something happens to me it's in my succession plan that she you know runs the stores and she's done a great job and she's amazing i have ian weddle who is our manager in broken arrow and he is such a great guy and we have maureen dunbar who manages my cherry street store and they are just the best they care more about these stores than I mean, almost as much as they carry almost as much as I do. And no one cares about your business as much as you do. And let me tell you, they love their stores. They love our team. They love our artists. And, you know, that's one of the things I didn't even think about when I bought Pinos was how much I would grow our family. I feel like everyone that works at Pinos is a family member. I care about them just the same. I care about that their families are okay. I care about that they survived COVID or that they, you know, are here and around customers. And, and it's funny because we all have a really cool rapport. We tell each other the good, the bad, the ugly, and we all just get along and it's, it's amazing. And we also have a, a zero drama policy and we're very big on that. So when people start working for us, we tell them if they want to start things or drama or gossip or create situations, we is zero tolerance. We make them sign a thing saying if they create drama, they're not on the team. And I don't care what a great artist they are or great person. We just won't tolerate it. And it's, 
ended up turning out to be one of the best things we could ever do. Our team cares. They step up to the plate. I mean, they hustle and I love it. And I don't know if, if you've ever painted with us, but I, I highly encourage you to come, not because I own the stores, but because it's an experience. Um, I absolutely love, love, love what we do for the community. And I think that's one of the reasons why I went ahead and like quit a great career. And I was on a really pretty good trajectory in the oil and gas industry. And I gave it all up to try this because I really believed in the concept. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that happen where we just didn't even see the where we would reach and what we would do. And so like, for example, we had this couple come in one time at the Cherry Street store. I won't ever forget it. I happened to stop in and do a store tour one night and stopped at all three stores. And there was this couple that was sitting at the end of one of the tables and they were having the best date ever. They were the cutest couple. They were probably in their fifties and they were laughing, singing, drinking. And my staff was like, my God, they're like the funnest couple we've ever had. And um, one of my artists went up to him and said, are you all celebrating anything tonight? And they go, actually, we're getting divorced on Monday and this is our last date with each other. And I remember we all were like, wait, what? And so they were like, yeah, we just decided we just, we, we are not good for each other. Our family's just best if we just get divorced and go our separate ways. And so this is just our last like hang out with each other, which I thought was really interesting. And um, anyways, long story short, we were like, man, they were so much fun. We had a good time with them. A year later, I happened to be in the studio that night with some of the same staff and that couple came in and we were like, oh my God, we remember you. And they were like, funny enough, that date reminded us why we loved each other so much and we didn't get divorced. And so they were celebrating their one year anniversary of staying married. And so there's things like that, that I wasn't expecting to hear, I know, right? Oh, I could, I could tell stories that would just make you cry of like family members who haven't seen each other in years and haven't spoke for years that reached out to each other. Okay, I'll tell this one. There was a mom that came in and she was like, I have to tell you, Pinos saved my family. And I'm like, okay, we paint and drink and we like listen to rock music. Like, I'm not sure that's what you meant to say. And she said, well, I haven't talked to my daughter. My daughter left home when she was 18. She's 21 now. And we haven't spoke since we, we had a really, uh, really uncomfortable con uh, relationship. And I have been trying to get back in her good graces for years. She got in involved in the wrong crowd and I was trying to get her away from them. And she just cut me out of her life. And she said, you know, I know she's still alive because I see her Facebook posts and, and stuff. And so I follow her and she said, I emailed her and said, I made two reservations at Pino's Palette on this Saturday afternoon for this class at 2 p.m. All I ask is that you show up so I can see you. I, you don't have to speak to me. I just want you to show up so I can see you and know that you're okay, which I'm gonna start crying. So anyways, she made the reservation fully ex ex anticipating that her daughter would not show up and that she would just sit here by herself and paint and have a good time. And um, funny enough, her daughter showed up and she said, we didn't speak for the first hour of the class. And then about halfway through the class, her daughter looked at her and just said, I'm sorry. And she said, from there it took off. See, it gets me choked up. And she said, we're best friends now. We talk every day. Those are the stories. Ugly cry, wait. Okay, let me get myself together. <laughs> Those are the stories that I don't anticipate as a business owner. And so I love what we do for this community. And so why am I crying on camera? Oh my goodness. So anyways, I love what we do and I love what we do for certain people in this community who have a very cool skill set that most of us will never have. And that sometimes they don't fit into the normal job of sitting behind a desk at, you know, a big corporation. And so I love that we have these wonderful people that work here that are brilliantly smart and so creative. And this gives them that outlet to teach on stage with their wonderful personalities and their amazing talents. And what's really cool is having customers come up to me. And if I have like my Pinot shirt on and I'm in the grocery store, 
I don't know why people always come up to me at the grocery store and they're always like, I was at your place. I recognize you or, or if I have my shirt on, they'll say, I see your shirt. I saw that guy, I went to Pino's last weekend and had so much fun in class and they were like, man, your teachers are rock stars. And it's funny because people start to know their names. They like follow, start following them on social media. And so it's, it's super cute to like have somebody come up to me and start telling me how awesome our team is. And, um, and you know, they'll, they'll even call the studio and ask like, hey, what night is Brian teaching? I want to find the next class that he's teaching because I want to go and, you know, to his class. And so anyways, it's just a lot of fun. And I, like I said, I love what we do. My parents, when I was growing up, they were very um, involved in the community. My parents always volunteered. And so I took, that was just very ingrained in me. And so one of the things that I love that we do here is partner with everyone in the community. So we give a lot, we give about $20,000 away every year of auction items and things like that for all the nonprofits in town. Um, we do painting it forwards and we give um, a portion of every seat sold at the painting it forwards back to the nonprofits when we host those events for them. And, you know, by doing that, it makes us a part of the community and it also makes us feel good about being a part of the community and knowing that we're helping others. And so, um, you know, I'm an only child and I've always said I wanted this massive family. Well, now I feel like I have a really big family. I only have one kiddo and I'm my wonderful husband at home. And so, you know, it's, it's like, I feel like having Pinos gave me that large family I always wanted. And then being a part of the community made me feel like I have a bigger family. And so, um, you know, I love what we do. Like I said, we have three different um, locations. And you know, it's funny, each location has its own quirky little personality and each customer base is completely different. So I don't know how you all feel running a business or owning a business right now during COVID, but everything that I have worked my career off with Pinos to learn and to study and to track customer habits, all just kind of like literally if you opened the door and like threw it out the window it all just went <laughs> so i'm kind of having to rewrite the book and kind of adapt and and you know it's one of those things where coming from corporate america when i look at something like pinos i think well how would that even relate to me like i have friends who own manufacturing companies or you know i worked like i said at quick trip for years and it's funny because we're all kind of interconnected right like i always say there's a big wagon wheel and everyone is a spoke on it so every industry keeps that wheel round and so it all takes everyone to spin right we need people who work in corporate america who have disposable income to spend at places like pinos we need you know bakeries to be open so that way we can you know have outlets like that we need manufacturing we need you know big corporate we need we need people with technical traits and it all, we're all on this big wheel together. We're all an equal portion of it. And it's been really kind of cool to see how everyone's kind of adapted in the wheel to keep the wheel spinning through all of this. You know, we had to change our business model to deal with COVID and go virtual for those that are uncomfortable coming in. And I'm not gonna lie, I was kicking and screaming. My staff was like, we gotta do this. You have to adapt. And I knew that we had to, but I didn't want to and I can be pretty stubborn. So it took me a while to get, you know, my head wrapped around it and kind of get on board. And so, um, you know, now we have to go kits where you purchase them online and you, we send you a, we email you a tutorial. We send you home with the paints, the canvas and all the supplies that are needed for that tutorial. And then we also have live virtual where you sign up for the class, come by and get your supplies before class and you paint with the live in studio class. So we have three models now we have in studio like always we have take home kits and then we have live virtual and you know it's actually been kind of fun technical stuff is not my skill or my wheelhouse so i've had to learn really quick how to be a zoom expert and run cameras and pay people to come wire sound systems and all this stuff and so um it's been a challenge but um we we you know we got past that hurdle and so anyways it's been a lot of fun it's definitely been hard um, you know, I'm a small business and we are entertainment. So we were greatly affected 
um, with our sales. And so I was trying to be smart to save the company and also to save everyone's jobs um, because I take pride in employing all these people and I want them all to you know, know that this is a safe place to land and it'll still be here. So I applied for the PPP, the EIDL, the grants, all of that and have utilized them accordingly you know, and, and so far we have made it. And my managers have hustled like you've never seen. And, um, you know, excellent customer service, taking care of everybody. And, um, you know, we haven't lost any employees. We've been able to make it work. And, um, you know, by the grace of God go I, we are still here and we're thriving. Um, you know, there was a couple months that got really scary um, and then, perfect timing the PPP came through and helped us out tremendously and um, you know and then the idol came through and that helped and all of a sudden now everyone's getting comfortable getting back out again right and so our sales are gradually on the upswing thank you Lord and um, anyways that was a, a long summary around the wheel but I just wanted everyone to know that you know I'm just a positive person I'm always happy and I'm always positive and so sometimes I just don't talk about not the negative, because I don't think it's negative. I always feel like when you're under pressure, that's when you learn the most about yourself and you learn the most about your situation. And it's what you do with that pressure is what matters. And so sometimes it looks like I just probably am all happy all the time, but it's more of it not being a negative thing. I don't talk about it. It's me trying to go through the process of what is the lesson in this and how do I get out of it? Or how do I grow out of it? And um, you know, I think it's important to talk about that because you know, some people just wherever they walk, they have golden horseshoes on themselves and they just look out of everything. And um, I just laugh and say, it's just my crazy life of things like, you know, thinking people thinking I'm opening a strip club or banks not giving me money after I buy a franchise and things like that. And just kind of like, I'm going to wing it. I'm going to figure it out. And so far we've been able to figure it out. And so um, I just want everyone to know that we're all normal and we're all here together. <laughs> um, doesn't matter what kind of business you're in. Um, we all have our struggles, but we also have our victories and our triumphs. And so, um, and that was my stomach growling, by the way. I haven't eaten and it just sounded like a T-Rex just came around the corner. <laughs> so anyways, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I'm happy to answer anything. And I'm very candid. Um, you know, I talk about my breast cancer journey um, a lot. And about five years ago, it was right after I opened the BA store, um, I went in for a preventative double mastectomy. And um, I knew it was coming, obviously, because I went in for a preventative double mastectomy. I had a 94% chance of getting breast cancer. So I went in for a preventative double mastectomy and got a call. Um, speaking of calling, my husband's calling. Um, he clearly doesn't know I'm on Zoom. Um, Anyways, I went in and had my preventative double mastectomy before I got breast cancer and they called me um, four days after the surgery and said, you're not going to believe this. But even though you had all these scans, ultrasounds, we went in for a preventative surgery and we accidentally found a tumor in the removed tissue as we were throwing it away. And it turns out it was the deadliest kind of breast cancer you could have. And you are now having to go through treatment and perfect. So long story short. Five years, I hit my five year mark this year, which means I'm cancer free. Thank you, Lord. And you know, my team stepped up during that whole time when I had to do an about face and be like, okay, well, I'm going in for a preventative surgery. I'll be out for just a few weeks, but I'll be fine. And all of a sudden went this way. And then the next thing I knew I was going this direction with chemo and rocking my bald look at all the chamber events and looking like Uncle Fester. I rocked that, do not. I did. I rocked the bald look and I actually loved it because I didn't have to buy shampoo or do my hair, <laughs> but I learned to accessorize with crazy earrings. So it was all good. So my staff did not paint my head. I, ha I have a lot of people ask me that, but I didn't, my staff did not paint my bald head when it was bald. So anyways, I, um, I'd love to answer any questions if anyone has any. And um, anyways, I'm appreciative that everyone's here today. And, um, you know, we're all in this together, fighting and making it happen. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, I feel like you shared a piece of your heart with us this afternoon. And that is why we love you. We 
I could not look wait any longer for you to talk today. You made us cry last year at the Summit and Awards, and goodness, you were making me wipe tears again today. So thank you. I'm a weep. I have become a weeper. <laughs> After me the age too. of 40, I'm a weeper. Why is that? <laughs> well, I know we have a few questions that are coming in for you and some that I also want to make sure we ask, but you spoke about building your family and um, having people that care about your business just as much as you do. What's the team mantra you have, or do you have some kind of mission statement that you live by that really helps with um, making your employees feel like family? Well, you know, that's a really great question. and No one's ever asked me that. So thank you for putting me on the spot. I'm not good with that one. Um, you know, we don't have a mantra. The only thing I do say is no drama. Um, but I will say we have been extremely fortunate to be very tight knit and we don't allow just anybody in and all of us kind of have to agree on the person before we bring them into the team and kind of bring them in, in, into the family, so to speak. And it's kind of like the best of both worlds. It's a family you get to choose. Um, and so, you know, I think we've all grown. I've grown as a leader. Um, I still make really big mistakes. And, um, you know, there's sometimes where the staff's like, we got this. We would prefer that you not handle that and we just take it on. And so sometimes that's very humbling. But at the same time, I also trust them enough to just hand it to them. And I think sometimes when you stop trying to micromanage people, it empowers them to step up. And I think it also shows them that you trust them. And there is no greater compliment to give somebody than to hand them your business and say, I trust you to represent the studio today or your business. And so I think it's, it's powerful and it's empowering to the staff when they know that they get to be here at night and the management isn't here and they can run the stores and they know that we trust them their judgment. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Lisa. I have a few comments I wanna to read to you. Someone said, congrats on five years. They're also two years cancer free and love you. Talk. Someone else saying, thank you for your business all of these years. Um, we do have a question. What are you most hopeful for your business in 2021? Oh my God, that we survived 2020. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I honestly, I feel like we're kind of one of those business models where not that we're stuck in a box, but you know, we are a franchise. So there's only so many things I can do to, to change that business model. And sometimes, um, I don't know if you all have ever heard of a gentleman named Marcus Lemonis. He, uh, he has a, he owns Camping World, but he w started out as a, 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 an immigrant and he was adopted into a family and he was raised very poor. And now he's one of the most wealthiest men. He has a show on CNBC called The Prophet, like the money prophet, not like the God prophet. And I started watching his shows one night. I couldn't sleep. And so I know I'm such a nerd. The only time I, when I can't sleep, most people watch like Yellowstone and I watch The Prophet. So what his, what his premise is, is he goes into businesses that are failing and he teaches them how to fix it and gives them their businesses back. And I watched that religiously. I've never missed an episode. And I watched that show and I learned more from him talking about his three P's, people, process, and product. And I realized if you empower people and you hire the right people, the product will take care of itself and the processes, if you establish processes, it'll make everything right. And he also says, stick to your core product. Cause when you start branching out and doing all this stuff, you know, I've seen during COVID people having to hustle. Well, we changed and started offering virtual and take home kits, which I, like I said, I didn't want to do because the more you get away from your core product, the, the more you dilute yourself and you dilute your brand. It doesn't matter what product it is. It'd be like a manufacturer who made a car part and all of a sudden now they're making light poles. Well, that confuses your product thing. And so one of the things he tells people is when you start to branch out, you lose your consistency and your brand. And that's one of the things that in 2021, my thing is consistency. I want us to survive 2020 and I want us to stay consistent. I don't think our virtual opportunities right now are probably gonna go away. Um, as much as I want it to just be in the studio because that's where people have the most fun um, and we can control our brand when it's here in the studio. But um, I think that's for 2021 is getting through this year, which I, I'm sure we're gonna do since we're now in the upswing of sales and we had the grants and, and made it through our toughest time. And so um, 
but just being adaptable, but staying really consistent and staying right on brand. That's my goal. Kind of on that topic of the people, how has your involvement in the chamber helped you personally and professionally? Oh my goodness. Okay, so you all have never asked me this before, so I'm just gonna say it. Networking by far is the best because I have met more people who have pulled me through some of my trying, my most trying times as a business owner, um, you know, dealing with a difficult former employee that I didn't know how to manage, I didn't know how to handle it. And knowing that there were some people in the chamber that owned staffing companies or coaching companies that I utilized their services on how to coach me through some of that. Um, I have met my accounting firm that I use because I am not good at accounting at all. I will own that. I will fly that flag as high as possible. Um, and so I met my accounting firm and my accountant through the chamber. Um, my, uh, my architect, Weldon Bowman, who is the chairman this year, or the chair uh, this year, he designed my studio for me. Um, and, you know, I've met, I've utilized people that I've met through the chamber and it has really helped me to be more connected in what's going on. Um, you know, one of my favorite things that I do through the chamber is I do the DC fly-in. You know, there is nothing more humbling than flying to DC and seeing, you know, behind the scenes, you, you, it's all smoke and mirrors, right? You, you hear about all the legislation, you hear about all these legislators and senators and congressmen. But when you go to DC and when you show up with the chamber and they're like, oh, the Tulsa chamber's in town, we will roll out the red carpet for those business owners and we will answer questions honestly and we will just open the curtain. And it's crazy walking into the room and seeing people that you see on C-SPAN or CNN all the time talking about the things that actually directly affect your business. Um, it's unbelievable. I got to meet with um, Senator Lankford a week ago and got to talk to him and I had no idea, even though he's from Oklahoma, I had no idea he was one of the four, three or four key people who created the PPP program that saved millions of companies. And that's amazing. I would never get that opportunity to sit down and have lunch with him and talk to him over an Andalini's pizza and talk to him about, hey, did it work for you? What could we do better if we do a second round? Like what are the, some of the, the legal things behind it we could change to make it easier for it to be forgiven? That stuff is, I mean, that's, you just can't, that's just amazing to me. So, um, you know, sorry, I got long winded. You're good, Lisa. No, you give informative answers that people can utilize. And that's true. I haven't had the chance to go to the DC flying, but you need to go on the next one because it's uh, my favorite trip. I look forward to it every year. I know. Thank you, COVID. Um, as you mentioned at the very beginning, you're working in Houston, then thought this is a great concept for Tulsa. What makes Tulsa such a unique place to start a business, to open a business? Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, they're entrepreneur friendly and now there's all these incubators. So I don't want anyone to take this out of context. When I was growing up here, Tulsa was, it, it's, you know, a little bit bigger now, but it's still not the biggest city. And they were a little bit old school and a little bit closed minded. And I think if I would have tried to open something like Pino's years before, it would have never taken off. It was, it was pretty, pretty narrow minded. And now in the last, I would say in my adult life, I mean, I'd say in the last 10 years, we've had so many people move in from other states, bringing ideas, bringing concepts. And then we've got these great people like Steve Kaiser building, you know, the gathering place and all these other people who are very philanthropic, opening up these incubators, letting these people who say, I can't just start a business by myself, but if somebody will help fund me to get this idea across the you know, finish line, maybe we can bring things to Tulsa. And like that Tulsa remote program, I met somebody who is from um, upstate New York and they're here six months out of the year working their business out of Tulsa and they love it. And now they're looking at moving their entire family to Tulsa because they love Tulsa so much. And I think, you know, there's things that are becoming to the forefront. I love that people think we're the new Austin because of the music and the art scene and the creativeness and all the cool stuff. And so Tulsa's really evolved and it's very entrepreneur friendly. Banks are getting around, um, you know, rallying around people who have great business ideas <clears throat> and funding their programs. And so, you know, I, I love how we've evolved for sure. 
I have one more question for okay. you, and I'm gonna. This is a challenge. In one sentence, oh, geez. what would <laughs> what would, in one sentence what would be your advice to a person wanting to open a business in Tulsa? Do your homework. If I only have one sentence, that's it, because I kind of flew blind, and that was really dumb. <laughs> So I say, do your homework, reach out, reach out to people, do your homework, network with people and really see if there's a need for the product. I have a lot of people ask me for business advice and some of the things that they bring to me, I, you know, I don't want to crush people's dreams, but some, and who am I to tell them it won't work, but sometimes they'll come to me and be like, I'm thinking of opening the store where you sell comforters and that's all that it is is comforters. And I'm like, well, you can get those at Target and Walmart and at home and they get a lot cheaper pricing than you probably would trying to open a store and it's like so make sure there's a need for it that's another thing that i always say is you know if you can do it better same price and there's a need for it you know one of the things i this is a total side note but when i worked at quick trip i was extremely fortunate that my desk was in the hallway they had run out of office space at the original corporate office by the airport and when I started, they put me next to the copy machine in the hallway. I'm not kidding. I was in a little cubicle. Everyone had these big offices and I was at a, next to a copy machine. Well, what people didn't realize, and they would be like, you're that copy girl. And I'm like, yeah, I work in marketing. I don't make copies, but my desk is next to the copy machine. But what they didn't realize is my desk happened to be outside Chester Cadjo's office, who is the founder and CEO of Quick Trip. I didn't know who he was for the first few weeks I worked there. I thought he was the janitor. Cause every time I saw him, he was taking out the trash. And one morning he came and sat down in my little cube next to the, the copy machine and he brought his coffee and he sat down and just started talking to me. And we developed this cute little friendship. And, um, he, and every morning we, I'm a very early riser. So I would go to work every morning really early at like 6.30 before everyone get there at eight. He always was there too. So he and I would have coffee, end up having coffee every morning together. And I got to just sit next to this brilliant man. And one of the things, I will never forget he said to me is make sure there's a need for what you have and he explained to me that quick trip has gas and they funny enough they used to sell wigs in the original stores because women used to wear wigs it was a big deal and he would like talk about all these things that they used to have in the stores that were like needs for people and so I will never forget that that was a big thing when I was thinking about opening Pinos is I remember going Chester just told me, is there a need for it? And I felt like there needed to be another smart entertainment venue. So that's why I thought Pinot's would be a good fit. So anyways, it was a total side note, but I love that story because I, I will cherish those mornings with him forever, so. I love that, Lisa, because it's not just applied in your business that you own, but you can apply it also to yourself, um, do self-exploration, but <clears throat> I just want to thank everybody today for joining us and a special thank you to the Connections Programs and Events Committee and Chair Jerry Barrientos, and of course our generous sponsors for making today's event possible. And thank you to Lisa Riley for sharing your heart with us today. At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to answer a, a survey question for us about today's event. On a scale of one to 10, how did today's event meet your expectations? One being the lowest and 10 being the best. I'll give you all a few moments to answer that question. Just a few more moments. Once again, one being the lowest, 10 being the best. Okay, thank you all for taking that. Your feedback will help us shape future programming, connection programming, so thank you for your participation. The Chamber's 2020 Small Business Summit and Award winners will be announced at the Tulsa Small Business Summit and Awards on September 22nd. So again, the 2020 Small Business Award winners will be announced at the Tulsa Small Business Summit and Awards on September 22nd. This event will include keynote presentations from Tracy Spears and Dr. Gustavo Grodnitsky and breakout sessions on topics such as sales in the digital landscape, employee engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and more. You can register for all of the, all of these events listed on your screen and also the summits and uh, uh, pardon me, on TulsaChamber.com slash events. Again, you can register for all of these events and more at TulsaChamber.com slash events. If the Chamber can be of assistance to you during this time, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thanks again, everyone, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.